We'll go to chapter three. That's where we're going to start, and uh, we'll pick up from there. I don't know how far I'm going to get tonight because it's a little longer than I thought it was going to be. But uh, let's pray. Father God, we praise you tonight. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, that the Word of God always meets us at our point of need, Father. And Lord, we praise you for it. And God, we just ask that the Holy Ghost would minister to everyone in this room tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've been studying about the blood covenant. Now people say, well, Pastor, you haven't talked about any, any about the blood covenant from day one. You, have, you just said what a blood covenant is to where to to cut where the blood flows. Well, I'm laying a foundation so we can look at, really the blood covenant that we talk about is the new and better covenant based on better promises, Hebrews chapter eight. And so uh, I, I'm laying this down because tonight I'm excited because we've already looked through this and, and last week we looked through uh, at verses 15 and uh, down to, we made it to verse 20. We basically can summarize it like the curses came on man because uh, Adam sinned, all right? God wanted the best for Adam, but, you know, and God wants to, how many know God wants the best for us? Yeah. Uh, that's right. But, but you know what? It's like everything else. People choose their own, own way, and Adam chose his way. He, he sinned. He didn't listen to God, and uh, it's the same with us. God will speak to our hearts, and so we're just hard-headed people. We're human beings, and that happens. But, uh, and, and we choose to do things our way all the time, you know, a lot of the times, not all the time. And, and what happens when we do that, we never abide in God's best, you know. Uh, in Adam, we say, we use the term, Adam committed high treason. treason. And what he did, he lost his relationship with God. But how many know God really loved Adam? Amen. And uh, he lost his relationship. The moment he lost that relationship with Adam, the minute he was spiritually separated from God, Adam, Adam, the first thing that happened, the Bible tells us he was afraid. The second thing the Bible tells us is he hid himself. And that's always the place. When people, whenever they sin, they get afraid of God. And then they run from God instead of running to God because that's where our help is right. okay and uh, but God had a plan and that plan went into effect at that very moment when Adam sinned God you know God knows everything and we looked at the fact last week that Adam even though he was God's man on, on planet earth at the time he had authority over the fish of the sea the fowls of the air over everything that creeps on the earth but he lost that authority. He had a God-given authority over things on the earth. He sinned. He blew it. Adam still maintained authority, but it was in a different realm now. Okay? It wasn't no longer in the realm of God. It was in the realm of Satan. All right? And, and God, at that point, God speaks his plan into existence. When we looked at this, he said what he was going to do. He said he was going to put enmity between the, the serpent and the woman. Serpent representing the devil, the woman representing the mother of, you know, creation, sort of, kind of. But, uh, not, not without getting into Mother Earth or <laughs> anything like that. But the thing about it, that's the first prophecy of Jesus coming into the earth. You know, God does, God is systematic. He does things systematically. So he had to speak it into existence. But then it took him 4,000 years to get at Jesus here. Okay, we kind of like, we want things now. You know, we're like that J.J. Wentworth. Yeah. It's my money and I want it now. Uh, it doesn't work that way all the time. Okay, but at this point, God put his plan into existence. And uh, now Adam, at this point, was no longer a slave to God. He was a slave to sin because everything that came on the earth the curse that came Adam was a slave to that sin do you because that's what caused it but uh, how do you know we today thank God that he sent Jesus because we're under grace we live by the grace of God but you see grace isn't the license to go sin and I talked about this at the end last week 
being under, actually being under grace, and we're a big, we, I believe in grace, more grace, because God is a grace God, but it's a dangerous place to get when you uh, walk in grace, because some people use it as a license to sin, okay? Uh, and, and so it, be, it could become dangerous. And the reason it becomes dangerous is because the devil will whisper in your ear. He'll say, you know, God loves you, you're under grace, and you know, if you do something wrong, don't worry about it. You know, God loves you. And he hits us with that God loves you. It's almost like, don't worry, Eve. God knows if you eat it, you're going to be like him. So he does this to us, and, and, and you're under grace, and if you're not careful... We sin, and then we really feel bad about it, and we go through those steps, and then we repent, we say, God, I'm sorry, and then we do it again, and it's, yeah, it still hurts, but it's, the pain's a little easier, you know, and then finally your, your, your conscience gets seared in that area, and you become a slave to sin again, even though you're born again. You could still be a slave to sin. That's why there's so many Christians out there that are a slave to different things. In life, it's because they never learned how to be a slave to righteousness. Because what you serve is what you become a slave to. Amen? So now let's look, go on, and because this is the part I wanted to get to. Let's just uh, look at verse 20. It says in verse 20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin to clothe them. Now, what we have at this, this point, in the, this is the first time in the Word of God that you have a, a, a hint of the blood covenant. Because you need to... See, I never pay too much attention to this verse of Scripture until I started studying the blood covenant. In order for there to be... Co Remember back in the beginning? Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together. And it didn't work because fig leaves dry up and they blow away and they're naked again. Right? Amen. So God comes along. He said, I'm going to bring put enmity between the serpent and the woman. And the very next thing God does is give them coats of skin. So you have to ask yourself this question. Where did the skins come from? Something had to be sacrificed. Blood had to be shed. So he could cover their sin. Are you listening to me? And that's key, because that is the very first time, and we're going to see the second time blood is shed here in a minute, and hopefully tonight, but uh, that's the first time that blood is shed. And, 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 and if you study, it's, it's the blood that covered the sin. In our case, with Jesus, it, his blood washed away our sin. But back starting from that point forward until Jesus Christ came, right on down through... Uh, 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 Noah and Moses and and Joseph and the, everyone right down on down the line, David, until they always had to shed blood. You get into the law. They were constantly shedding blood to cover their sin. Okay, but that's God's way. And, and that's what happened here. So we have a substitute. The substitutional sacrifice of an animal and his blood was spilt to cover their shame. Okay? Again, he tried to do it by himself with the fig leaves, but it didn't work. And uh, so we have the principle of an animal being slain for a sacrifice. And we said one of the things they did when they had a, a, a especially in the Hebrew nation, whenever they entered into a covenant with a foreign nation, there was an, act, an animal was sacrificed. Okay? So, uh, so now we look at verse 22. And the Lord said, the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now least he put out of his hand, put out his hand, and eat of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Now, here, let's look at that for one second. 
Uh, but behold, the man has become like one of us. He knows good and evil. Remember what I said, I think, last week. I think I said it every week. The knowledge of the tree of good and evil is really the knowledge of the tree of human good versus human evil. And it's been the battle ever since. Got to get it through our head. God, they, they only knew God good. They didn't know evil. <coughs> they didn't know what sin was. They didn't know anything that God loved them and God took care of them. The moment they ate of that tree, all of a sudden their eyes are open and they saw evil. They saw good. Good has to overcome evil. That's what we have. That's why we have all these organizations out there trying to do good, feed the hungry, doing all these things. And, and, I, and I applaud them. But the only salvation for everyone is Jesus. Amen. Okay? So, he goes on again in this verse. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now least he put out, of his, put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So here's what happened. Remember way back in the beginning, God put him in a garden. And he said, tend and keep it. Adam had a sphere of influence. There was an enemy there. The enemy me was Satan. And I am going to do that teaching. And I study every day. I look at it and study about the gap, the Genesis gap. Okay? And it, but that's for now. But he put him in this sphere of influence because there was an enemy there. Satan was cast out of heaven. He was here on the earth. It was his domain. You know? And he's saying, Adam, tend and keep it. Guard it, protect it. It is your sphere of influence. Now, they lost their sphere of influence. God put them out of the garden. Because... Their sin, but because of their sin, they knew the difference, again, between human good and human evil. So, they, you know, they were supposed to protect that God good. That's what we have to do in our own personal lives, in our walk with the Lord. We need to protect the goodness that God has done to us and not step out of that sphere. Because the minute we step out, we get ourselves in trouble. Over and over again. So they had to leave the garden. And the reason they had to leave the garden is because they might have ate of the tree of life. And the tree of life in the garden represents Jesus. I don't know what kind of tree it was. You know, you have, you know, I read all these commentaries and all these theologians. Everybody has their, like, deal with the tree of life is. But it rep we know it represents Jesus because he is life. But they couldn't go eat of the tree of life. Because had they eaten of the tree of life, eaten of the tree of life, they would have been eternally damned and there would have been no salvation for us. We would be like those movies we see on television, the Hunger Games and all that. That's what we'd be like. Just animals going after other animals. Survival of the fittest. Okay. So... <laughs> So verse 24, he, so he drove out the man, drove out the man, and he placed a cherubim at the east end of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the tree of life. So he lost, Adam lost his estate with God, all right? And God was protecting Adam from himself. You know, when people... Uh, Wherever, you know, they go into a rehab or they, they get incarcerated, whatever someone does, you know, really what's happening in that, you know, they're not the nicest places to be for sure, but still, they're pr being protected from themselves. Because probably on the street, they can only get in trouble. Amen. So God says, okay, you're out of the garden, it's locked up, you can't go near it because Adam, I'm protecting you. Probably didn't feel like it was protecting Adam. He said, now I gotta work, now I gotta sweat, now I gotta till the ground, now there's weeds and there's thistles and all this stuff's going on. You're protecting me? Yeah, I'm protecting you from, damn, from eternal damnation. Amen. But we don't always look at it that way. And so, again, if he had ate, eaten of that tree, he would have been forever damned. And so would we have been. But how many of you know God's always on the move? Amen. 
And how many of you know the devil's always on the move to thwart God? Always. Now, let's look at this. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time as brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process, I'm just going to read down a little bit here. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. I'm just going to say this from the outset. It's always good to give God your best. Amen. And if you're getting upset because somebody else, you think God's got a little favor on them, well, check out what you're doing. Because that little deal right there with Cain and Abel hasn't stopped in the earth today. People are always jealous of other people. Okay, so uh, so as we get down here, it says, in, in the King James Version, it actually says, their fat or the fat thereof. And, and the fat thereof indicates that it was a sacrifice. So Abel had to learn... Where this game, you know, we kind of like just read words and we kind of, we don't fill in the blanks. You know, God must have showed them how to kill the animal, how to sacrifice the blood. You know, they were the first family. They were really the first family. Okay? And, and so it was a sacrificial offering. If you look at Leviticus chapter 3 and chapter 4, you'll see that they always talk about when they had to bring that sacrifice, they had to bring the fat thereof. The best. That indicates the best. Had to be an animal, and it had to be the best. The blood. The fat there represents the blood. And uh, we, when we see here, it's really the starting of worship. Uh, as they brought their offerings to God. That's why when we do an offering, it's that is worship. To God. Amen. You are supposed to be being, bringing God your best. Amen. Whenever we do that. So when the first family is involved with blood sacrificing, uh, bl blood shedding, and blood sacrifice. God taught him that himself. Alright? And uh, it was done here in, in, in where he made the coats of skin with them, which we read. And see, God ordained it and initiated that sacrificial animals would be the way that, number one, it pointed toward a time that would, he would bring Jesus into the earth. And number two, he would be the sacrifice for the world, the Lamb of God. Okay, that's what that, all through history, especially Hebrew history. And we're going to look at something here called the righteous line. Another thing we call it, there's a book, I don't even know if it's still in print. It was called The Scarlet Thread of Redemption. One of the best books you'll ever read on the blood covenant. Okay, it doesn't talk about the blood covenant, but it's a fact about the blood covenant. That the, the, the uh, scarlet thread, what it, what's it? Redemption. I, my mind went. Uh, that happens, you know. Anyway. But he would be the sacrifice. But now, it says in verse 5, But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry. Isn't that the way? Yes. And it says his countenance fell. And Cain was just a liar. Just like his father, the devil. He's a liar. And, and God says, Cain, why are you so angry? It's like, like God didn't know why he was so angry, you know, like, God, it's a trick question here, you know. Why are you so angry? And why is your countenance fallen? And then he, he asks him, he goes, you know, and really what God is doing here, he gave Cain a chance to do right. 
And people, one time they argued with me. They said, well, but he, what could he do? He grew vegetables. Really? So he couldn't have, like, traded some vegetables? Or some meat? For an animal and do the sacrifice right? I don't know why we never want to do things God's way. We're going to do it our own way every time. But God gave him an out. Gave him a chance. Repentance. And, but he insisted on doing it his way. And, and we come down to verse 8. And verse 8 says, Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So now this is the first dysfunctional family in the Bible. Because Cain killed Abel and, Abel and eliminated a quarter of the population. That's a dysfunctional family. See, we think we have problems with our kids. How would you like to be Adam and Eve? All right? <laughs> you know? And, and so, in verse 7, I didn't read verse 7. Right. If you do well, you will not, will you not be accepted? And if you do not, well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should roll over it. Man, we could preach on that verse for a week. He's telling us in the book of Genesis that sin really wants to rule over you, but you should be ruling over sin. In the Genesis, chapter 4, he says, and, and then when you get to the New Testament, what's it talking about? Ruling and reigning with authority over all the temptations and everything that the devil tries to throw at us. Whether it's addictions, whether it's challenges in life, about anything. We're supposed to rule over those. And he could, all he had to do was say, let me go get a lamb from my brother. And sacrifice it. And everything would have been cool. He was a bum. As my mother would say. A bum. I could give you some other choice words my mother used to say too, but we're in church, so we won't do that. <laughs> Amen. Anyway, so he so he kills him. He came, he rose up against his brother. He commits the first murder. And guess what? You might not look at it this way, but you're gonna see. Blood was spilt again. You see, what we don't understand there is life in the blood. That's why blood, you were worried when I was going to get to that. I know she was biting at the bit. Uh, there's life in the blood, and blood is important to Jesus. And through the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, under the law, they weren't allowed to have blood. Because the life was in the blood. They believed that too. And if you go went to Africa and all those other places, they believed. That when they did a blood sacrifice and they mingled that blood together, the actual part of the spirit of the person they were entering into a covenant with was coming to live in them. What was that movie, Red Dawn? They drank the blood of the deer because it was supposed to give them power or spiritual. They made a covenant with one another at that point that they weren't going to like get over.